بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يذلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها لا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Indeed the praise is for Allah We praise him, we seek his help, we seek his forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evils that are within ourselves and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead this person astray. And whomsoever Allah leads astray, then there is no guide for him. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah who is alone with our partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the servant of Allah and his last messenger to all of mankind. O you who believe, fear Allah with a right that he should be feared with, and do not die unless you are Muslims. O mankind, fear your Lord who has created you from a single person, and from that person created his mate, and from them to scatter countless men and women throughout the earth. And fear Allah from whom you demand your mutual rights and do not cut off the relations with the wombs that have bore you. Indeed, Allah is a watcher over you. All you who believe, fear Allah and say that which is correct in order that Allah may rectify for you your deeds and forgive you of your sins. And whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger has achieved a tremendous achievement. As to what follows, certainly the most truthful speech is the Book of Allah. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the most evil of the matters of the newly invented matters in the religion, and every newly invented matter in the religion is innovation. And every innovation is going astray, and every going astray is in the hellfire. Mahabim bikum jami'an ahlim wa sahlin. This is our second class of the book Takarim al Islam Lir Mur'a, The Honor of Islam for the Woman, by the noble Sheikh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Mursin. Al-Badr, Hafidhahum Allah, Sheikh Abdul Razak, who was the son of the great scholar Sheikh Abdul Mursin, Al-Badr, may Allah preserve the both of them. We covered in the last class the importance of this topic, especially in this day and time 
where our Muslim sisters are under constant attack from the adversaries of Islam, from the modernists, those who want to take away from them their deen and destroy their relationship that they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and strip them of their piety, strip them of their piety and their, their chastity. They want the Muslim women to be like the other women in the world who are immoral, loose women without any type of haya, shyness. They want to take this away from the Muslim woman. So it's important that the Muslim woman, she knows her status in Islam and that her status is a great status. And that the Muslim woman knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised her and has honored her. And that the Muslim woman knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put legislation in place for her protection and for her honor and in defense of her. And other than that, from the importance that Islam gives to the Muslim woman, for as the scholars they mention, the mom, the woman, the woman, they are the backbone of the society. The woman, they are the backbone of the society, for they are the ones who cultivate the future generations. They are the ones who raise up the future leaders. So they're the backbone. They're the ones who keep the things together from the home, starting from the home. So the place of the Muslim woman is a great is a great one. And it's important that these matters are mentioned so that the woman she knows where she stands. So when the adversaries of Islam come with their doubts, she has the knowledge to keep her firm, to keep her feet firm on this deen. The Sheikh Abdul Razak, Hafizullah Ta'ala, he mentioned that the, the ni'mah of Allah upon his Muslim servant is tremendous and his favor and blessing upon him is great by way of him guiding the servant to this magnificent deen the deen of Islam and the deen of Islam is the deen of Allah which Allah is pleased with for his servants the deen of Islam is the deen that Allah has completed for his servants. And Allah doesn't accept from them any other deen. Other than Islam. Allah doesn't accept from them any deen other than Islam. As Allah Ta'ala he mentions, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. Today I have completed for you your religion and I have perfected my favor upon you. And I am pleased for you Islam as a religion, as your way of life. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions إن الدين عند الله الإسلام. Indeed, the deen with Allah, meaning the accepted deen, with Allah is al-Islam. And Allah Ta'ala, He mentions, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقَبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And whoever, whoever desires a religion other than Islam, Whoever desires a religion other than Al Islam, it will never be accepted from him. 
it will never be accepted from the person. And then, in the hereafter, the person will be from amongst the losers. These three verses, the first verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah, about Allah completing and perfecting the religion. The second verse in Surah Ali Imran, as well as the third verse in Surah Ali Imran. The first verse of Allah perfecting and completing and perfecting the deen, this lets the Muslim woman know that she is following a way of life that's complete and perfect. And she is following a way of life which has been completed and perfected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not a way of life that was made up by a human being and then the human being said, okay, this is the perfect way and then someone can come later on and find a mistake in it. It's not that. You're not going to find a mistake in that which Allah has completed and made perfect. Never. You're not going to find any contradictions in that which Allah has completed and made perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِي غَيْرِ لَا لَوَجْدُ وَلَوَجْدُ فِيهِ اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا Do they not ponder over the Qur'an? And had it been from other than Allah, they would have found many contradictions in it. If the Qur'an was from other than Allah, there would be many discrepancies and contradictions in it. Because mankind... He's, he makes mistakes. Mankind contradicts himself. Mankind says one thing today and another thing tomorrow. So there are no contradictions in Islam. There are no discrepancies in Islam. Because it comes from the one who is the all-wise and the all-knowing. It comes from the one who is the all-aware. It comes from the one who is most just. The one who is not oppressive. He comes from the one who is complete and perfect. And these are his words, so his words are complete and perfect. And the legislation that is based upon his words is going to be complete and perfect. So being that Allah is complete and perfect, his deen is complete and perfect. As for us, we are not complete and perfect. We are the ones who fall short. The blame doesn't go back to the deen. The blame goes back to us. So whenever we find ourselves in situations that are not praiseworthy and evil, the blame is upon us. It's not the deen that put us in that situation. We put ourselves in those evil and bad situations. So our safety and security is in following that perfect way of life. But when we leave following that perfect way of life, we open up ourselves to harm. To evil. We open up ourselves to misguidance, deviation, sin, transgression, and maybe even leaving the religion. Sometimes a person starts off doing one sin and leads to another sin and leads to another sin, and then next thing you know, the person gives up and abandons, abandons Islam. There's an old saying. Al-Ma'asi burid lil kufr. The acts of disobedience, they lead a person to disbelief. Acts of disobedience lead a person to disbelief. So we say to our Muslim sisters, be mindful that this way of life this religion of ours that we are following is a perfect way of life, a perfect religion, a perfect deen. Don't leave it for anything. Don't substitute it for anything. Or don't substitute anything for it, I should say. 
And don't put anything in its place and think that, it, that that's where your happiness is going to be. Let Islam always be foremost in your life. Let Islam always be that which you refer back to in all of your affairs. This is where your safety is at, my sisters in Islam. Islam is a blessing upon you. It's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not everybody can be a believing woman. I mean, the woman. Not all women in this world can be believing women. Allah chose you, my noble sisters. Allah has chosen you to be believing women. So this is a favor from Allah. You are from the chosen woman of this dunya. The majority of the women in the world are kafirat, are disbelieving women. Allah chose you to be from the best of the people of this earth. It's a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. Be grateful. The Shaykh mentions the statement of Allah in the deen and the Allah in Islam. That the deen with Allah is al-Islam. Meaning the only way of life that Allah accepts is al-Islam. And this is also backed up by the verse that comes after that the Shaykh mentioned. وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ الْخَاسِرِينَ Whoever desires a way of life, a deen, other than al-Islam, when we say the deen, the religion, this is an an entire way of life Islam is, alhamdulillah. Islam is a complete, perfect way of life. Anything other than al-Islam, Allah doesn't accept it. As Allah mentions, and whoever desires a deen other than Islam, it will never be accepted from the person. Then in the hereafter, the person will be from amongst the losers. The scholars, they say, desiring a deen or lifestyle other than al-Islam is divided into two categories. Number one, a person who desires a way of life other than al-Islam in totality. The second, the person who desires a way of life other than al-Islam partially. Who is the one who desires a way of life other than al-Islam in totality? This is the disbeliever. They don't want Islam at all. They choose disbelief over submission to Allah. They don't want Islam. So this person is being addressed here. And then you have the one who desires a way of life other than al-Islam, but in a partial way, this is the sinful Muslim, or the Muslim who is upon innovation. Because sins and innovation, this is not from Islam. So when a person is indulging in sin, in that aspect, they are choosing a way of life other than Islam, in that matter. Not in totality, but partially, in that specific situation. Or the people of innovation, their practice of innovation, if it's not innovation that expels them from Islam, the innovation that they are practicing in those affairs they are choosing a way other than al-Islam. Because innovation is not Islam. Innovation is something that is man-made. Shaitan-made. This is why the Prophet sallallahu mentioned, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ That whoever introduces something into this affair of ours, this, this religion of ours, this way of ours, if somebody introduces something into it that's not from it, it's rejected, it's not accepted. Or as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ 
whoever does an action that doesn't have our affair over it, meaning is not governed by Islam, is rejected. It's rejected. So Allah says, "Falain yukbala min." It will never be accepted from him. Wa huwa fil akhirati min al khasirin. And then in the hereafter, he'll be from amongst the losers. The scholars they say there are two types of losers on the day of judgment. The permanent losers and then the temporary losers. The permanent losers are the ones who desired other than Islam in totality. Like they rejected Islam in totality. They chose another whole other religion. These individuals are the permanent losers in the hereafter. The temporary losers are those Muslims who died with sins upon them and Matters of deviation in Allah, He didn't forgive them. So they will go to the hellfire temporarily, but then eventually they will come out. So there's a temporary loss for them. It's not permanent, it's temporary according to how long they remain in the hellfire. So their dur the duration that they remain in the hellfire, that's the duration of their loss. But for those who hold fast to the deen and they strive to practice Islam in all of their affairs in life, then these are the victorious ones, the ones who go straight to paradise. No stopping in the hellfire, no time in the hellfire. Straight into the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh mentions the statement of Allah, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُصُوكَ وَالْعِسْيَانِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةً وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ However, Allah has made beloved to you Iman, faith. And he has beautified it in your hearts. And he has made dislike to you, disbelief, corruption, and disobedience. Those are the ones who are guided. A virtue from Allah and a blessing. And Allah is all-knowing and all-wise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his favor upon the believers. Allah has made beloved to you iman. Meaning Islam is beloved to us. Because iman is Islam. When they are mentioned separately, iman is Islam and Islam is iman. Allah has made the deen beloved to the believers. We, we love our, our way of life. And it's important for our sisters to always love this deen. Always love everything about Islam. Don't hate anything about Islam. Hating something about the deen is apostasy from the deen. To hate something from the deen, meaning because it's the deen, that is. Not that something is difficult upon you, you find not that type of dislike. The dislike of the difficulty. But we're talking about the actual legislation itself. Don't hate anything from the legislation. For this is from the characteristics of the hypocrites. Allah Azza wa mentions, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَرِهُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأَحْبَطُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ That is because they hated what Allah has revealed, so Allah nullified all of their deeds. So hating something from the religion, meaning because it's the religion, this is apostasy from the deen. As for if a person finds difficulty in a practice and there is a dislike for the difficulty, this is not considered hate in the deen. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, Isbaq al-wudu' al-makarih. 
Like a person making a good wudu upon dislike. Does the person dislike the fact that Allah legislated wudu? No. The dislike meaning the discomfort that the person finds when making wudu when the water is cold. Like there's a great reward for that. A person makes a good, a sound, uh, legislated wudu even though the water is cold, even though it's difficult, the weather, you know, the inclement weather, and the person still makes a good wudu. That's what's intended. That's what's intended. Or oh, as Sheikh Saleh Fawzan Hafidhullah Ta'ala was asked about the, the sister who she doesn't want to be in a plural marriage situation. She doesn't like for her husband to take on another wife. Has she disbelieved? The Sheikh said, no, this is not, this is not disbelief. She doesn't, she doesn't hate the fact that Allah has legislated a plural marriage. She's just, she has a natural dislike for sharing her husband. It's not that she, she don't hate the legislation, she just doesn't want to share her husband. She's not comfortable with that. So the sheikh said, this woman is not a kafira. That's natural for her. You have some of the brothers being hasty, you know, in preceding al ilm making take fear upon sisters who uh, choose not to be in a plural marriage situation because of what the sheikh mentioned. That they're not comfortable being in plural marriage. Not because they don't hate what Allah has revealed, they just personally, they don't want to deal with that situation. That's the sister's choice. And it's not right for a brother to come and pronounce take fear upon the sister, say, oh, you hate what Allah has legislated. SubhanAllah will be humble. Did she say that? Does she believe that? Or is it that her discomfort is in the sharing of a husband because of her jealousy, her natural jealousy? And the Sheikh he mentioned that this is a natural type of uh, dislike. It's from the jealousy. Not because she hates the religion or hates what Allah has revealed. And then in other, in other times, brothers, we have to look at ourselves. A sister may not want to go in, into polygyny because of we're not responsible in handling those affairs. So the sister doesn't want to be involved in that. Can't blame her for that. Can't say, oh, she's a kafira. And you have brothers who overstep those boundaries and have declared our sisters to be disbelievers. This is a major sin upon them, upon them is to make tawbah. The Prophet wasallam said, whoever says, oh, kafir, to his brother and the matter is not so it returns back to the person and the scholars they say and this is one of the interpretations the sin returns back to the person some said no the tick fear returns back to the person because how can you call that person a kafir and that's your brother or sister in Islam and they practice the same religion that you practice so if that person is a kafir then you are a kafir you have the same religion but in any event, people shouldn't be hasty to be passing these type of judgments and rulings on people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made Iman beloved to us, to the believers, to the Muslims. Iman is the deen. Whenever Iman is mentioned by itself, it's is speaking about the entire deen. We love Islam, we love our way of life. We love the Salat, we love the Zakat, we love fasting Ramadan, making Hajj. We love the affair of giving Sadaqah, we love the affair of studying the knowledge of the Deen. Every aspect of Islam we ought to love. And for the sister specifically, love that which Allah Azawajal has legislated for you generally and love what Allah Azawajal has legislated for you specifically. Meaning those ahkam of the deen, those rules and regulations of the deen that are specifically for the women like hijab. The sisters should love the legislation of hijab. Allah legislated hijab for the protection of the believing woman. 
so that she is not harmed and harassed and hassled. And that she's recognized to be like a chaste woman. And that she preserves her chastity and doesn't make a dazzling display of herself like in the times of the pre-Islamic ignorance. She should love her hijab. She love to cover her body. Because this is something that Allah has legislated and this is something that's a part of faith. And Allah has beautified Iman in their hearts. There's a beauty in this deen. There's a beauty in the deen of Islam. And this is something that the sisters should take pride in. That they are following a way of life that beautifies them. We're not talking so much of the physical beauty. Even though, alhamdulillah, in Islam, you have that which encourages physical beauty for both men and women in the proper context and in the proper situations. But Islam makes the person beautiful. Starting with your character. Islam beautifies your character. Islam makes your heart beautiful. Allah made Islam beloved to you and beautified Islam to you. Now because of your practice of it, Islam makes you beautiful. Allah makes you beautiful by way of Islam and your practice of Islam. How many from amongst us, prior to our Islam, we were, we were bad people? We have some of us, prior to Islam, mashallah, we were people who had good character, prior, even prior to Islam, that's possible. But there are many from amongst us that prior to Islam, our character wasn't the best of character. And our behavior wasn't the best of the behavior. But then after accepting Islam and becoming Muslims, and we believe in Allah, and believe in the Messenger, and believe in His deen, our character became beautified. Our hearts became beautiful. Our speech became beautiful. Our actions became beautiful. Now the people... They, they love us. Now the people trust us. Prior to Islam, the people didn't trust us because of the way we were living. Prior to Islam, the people didn't want to be around us because of the way we were living. Prior to Islam, the relationships that we even had with family members were not good because of the way we were living. But now, alhamdulillah, because of our practice of the deen, our relationships are strong with our parents, brothers, siblings, aunts, and the likes. I know for myself, prior to Islam, uh, you know, right before I became a Muslim, you know, as a teenager, you know, I, I wasn't the best son to my mother. My mother, she worked hard to take care of me and to, to give me the things that I needed and wanted, you know, and working, working, and I repaid her with not listening. And, and, and subhanAllah, I knew better because growing up in Catholic school, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Right? Honor thy mother and thy father. But you know, growing up in the neighborhoods, you know, I grew up in and, and becoming a product of the environment, trying to be with the in crowd and you know, but begin to disrespect and disobey my mother. And it wasn't until I accepted Islam and began to practice Islam that mended the relationship between me and my mother. Alhamdulillah, we have a great relationship now, but prior to, like right before I became a Muslim that time, when I was young, we had a great relationship, but then when I got older and I started, you know, breaking curfew, not listening, it got bad. But alhamdulillah, in Islam, and I remember like the first khutbah I remember hearing ever in my life, the khatib, may Allah have mercy upon him as he passed away, the khatib, uh, the imam by the name of Abdul Baqi, 
He was from out here in Queens. They used to be in Brooklyn also. He was talking about Biru Walidei. Treating your parents with goodness. And then he started really going in about like how, like, you know, we don't treat our mothers well. And I'm, I'm a Kafir. I'm sitting there in Juma. And it was, it touched me. I, 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 I just remember I started crying, like, man, I'm, I'm not living right. Like, this is, this is not good. I, I gotta, I gotta get my act together. You know, he was, he, he was, he was hitting the point home. Wallahi, he was hitting the point home, and it was like he was talking directly to me. Like, I never met the man in my life. It's the first time I've ever seen this man in my life. May Allah have mercy upon him and forgive him. It was like he was talking right directly to me. You know, he, he, was, he was going off, so you know good. You know, your mother did this for you, and your mother did that for you. Look how you behave, and look how you repay your mothers, and... Is to be real men and stand up, take care of your mothers and honor your mothers, and he he was going off, man. And I just remember sitting there and his tears coming out my eyes because, like, my mother didn't deserve none of that that I was doing. Like I said, she took care of me, you know. Alhamdulillah, she did her best to protect me. She, you know, and she didn't have me exposed to nothing crazy and stuff. So. She didn't deserve it. So, you know, hearing, and then he, he was mentioning verses from the Quran and hadith about the importance of the mother, I remember. And then it was time to make salat. And I stood up and I prayed with them. I wasn't a Muslim, but I, I got in the line. And then when they went into sujood, it was, that was like, it, I was convinced. I said, okay, this is, this is the right way right here. So, you know, I kept going to the classes and stuff and studying, but it was the practice of Islam and, and knowing what Allah says in the Quran about the mothers specifically. Because Allah mentions the parents and then specifically mentions the mother after mentioning the parents. And we have commanded mankind or we have commanded the person as it relates to his parents, meaning to be dutiful to them. And then Allah says, his mother carried him in a state of weakness upon weakness. And then the term was two years. So Allah mentions parents and then mentions the mother specifically. Why? Because the mother has a bond with the child that the father can never have. And this is why when the Prophet ﷺ was questioned, Ya Rasulullah, Man ahaq bibirri, who has more rights to my my goodness? And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned ummu. Kala thumma man, kala ummu. Kala thumma man, kala ummu. Kala thumma thumma abu. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the questioner, "Your mother has most rights to your goodness." And then the person said, then who after? The prophet said, your mother. He said, then who after? The prophet said, your mother. Three times the prophet mentioned the mother. Your mother, your mother, your mother. He said, then who? He said, then your father. The father has position, right? But the mother is different. Why? The scholars, they say, because the mother has a connection with the child in three affairs that the father has no connection to. The pregnancy, yes, the father played his role, right, in the woman getting pregnant, his wife getting pregnant, the mother getting pregnant, by permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That's number one, the pregnancy. And then, secondly, giving birth, the labor, pushing out. The mother goes through that. The man may be there or not there. It's still the mother going through that. That's her in that labor. That's her pushing out the child. The men, we don't go through that pain that the mother goes through. 
And then the third matter, the nursing of the child, the breastfeeding of the child. That's the mother. Three things. So these three matters, specifically for the mother, so the, the scholars say the prophet mentioned the mother three times. Your mother, your mother, your mother, and then the father. So Islam beautifies us, makes our character beautiful, and it makes our dealings with the people beautiful. Perhaps Islam is what mended the relationships, like in my case, and, and many others have similar stories and similar situations. And then also, وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْإِسْيَانَ not only does Allah make Islam beloved to us, but He makes us to dislike disbelief and corruption and disobedience. These three matters, barakallah fikum, represent the five levels of disobedience or sin. The highest level of sin is major shirk and major kufr. We ought to hate this. Because Allah Azza wa Jal placed in our hearts to love Islam and to love the deen. So major shirk and major kufr is the total opposite of Islam. So it's important for the sisters that whatever is major shirk and major kufr, you're supposed to hate that. You're supposed to detest it. Then you move on to the next level under that. The lesser shirk and the lesser kufr. We're supposed to hate that also. Because the lesser shirk and lesser kufr leads to the major shirk and major kufr. Then under that is bid'ah. And that's the fusuq. You have two types of bid'ah, bid'ah al-mukaffirah and bid'ah al-mufassiqah. The bid'ah that makes the person a kafir, you can put that with al-kufr. And then you have the bid'ah that makes a person a fasiq. Allah mentions wal-fusuq. Wal-isyan, disobedience, these are the sins, yani al-kabair wa sagair the major sins and the minor sins. And the minor sins are called minor sins in relation to the major sins. But don't downplay the minor sins. Because the person keeps con uh, committing the minor sins until eventually they pile up and become major. No. So these are the five levels of disobedience or sins. Major shirk and major kufr, that's the highest. Under that, lesser shirk, lesser kufr. Under that, al bidah al mufasiqa Then al kabair then al sagair All of these things we are to dislike and hate. Because they go against Iman. Either it nullifies Iman in totality or it causes the Iman to be deficient. Can I ask you please? Mm. What's the difference between shirk and bidah? Shirk is you worship someone other than Allah. The major shirk. The lesser shirk is like to do an action to be praised by the people. The act of worship to be praised by the people. You want a reward from the people. The people say good things about you. Or a person swearing by other than Allah. This is lesser shirk, lesser kufr. Unless the person intends to magnify the one or the thing that they are swearing by other than Allah. But the act of swearing by other than Allah is lesser shirk. The Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, uh, Man halafa bi ghayrillah. That whoever swears by other than Allah, then he has committed kufr or shirk.
And like a person who says, I swear by my mother, or on my mother's grave, or as we used to say, uh, like growing up, I swear on my unborn child. Like, that's, 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 that's a kufr, that's a shirk. Or swearing by your dead grandfather. Swearing by anything other than Allah is less a shirk, less a kufr. Even swearing by the Prophet, it falls under that. People say, one Nabi, I swear by the Prophet. This is incorrect. People say, well, Kaaba, I swear by the Kaaba. No, say, well, Rabbil Kaaba. I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi you can swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, you can swear by the Lord of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but don't swear by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and don't swear by the Kaaba. Don't swear by the Amana. I swear by the Amana. Don't swear by anything except for Allah subhanahu wa taala. As the Prophet mentioned, "Man kana halifan fal yahlif billah aw liyasmud." Whoever is going to swear, let him swear by Allah or remain silent. Or remain silent. But swearing by other than Allah, this is lesser shirk, lesser kufr, unless the person intends to magnify the person or the thing that they're swearing by. Like you have some uh, from amongst the Sufiya, the Sufis, they magnify their sheikhs that who have died, so they swear in the name of the sheikh to magnify the sheikh. And some scholars mention to the point that they would rather swear by Allah lying than swear by the name of the sheikh and be lying. They'll say wallahi and lie before they say was sheikh bamba or fulan and then be lying because they're afraid the sheikh may do something to them. This is kufr shirk. So we swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't swear at all. So bid'ah, in answering your question, is a newly invented matter in the religion. Whether a statement, an action, or a belief that somebody makes up and adds it to the religion to get closer to Allah. The religion is perfect and complete. You can't add anything to the religion. This is bid'ah. Linguistically, bid'ah is anything that's new. So as an example, this microphone is bid'ah from the aspect of the worldly affairs, not in the religion. Airplanes, cars are also bid'ah. But it's not bid'ah in the religion, it's bid'ah in the worldly affairs. So bid'ah in the worldly affairs, it's okay, because it's just as long as it's not nothing against the religion. So we can use a microphone, we have the Adhan clock or the clock that has the time of the Salats on there. We have light bulbs, right? They didn't have these things centuries ago. So it's new, but it's just from the worldly affairs. Airplanes, cars, motorcycles, these things are new things. They are newly invented matters, but they are newly invented matters in the worldly affairs. So this doesn't enter into the statement of the Prophet wasallam, right? Be aware of the newly invented matters. He's talking about in the religion. Right? No one can ask. So there's no such thing as al bid'a al hasana fi deen. Or good innovation in the religion. Because the Prophet said, wa kulla muhdathatin bid'a wa kulla bid'atin dolala. Every newly invented matter is innovation, and every innovation is misguidance. How someone is going to come after Prophet Muhammad? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Every innovation Meaning in the religion is misguided Somebody's going to come and say No, there's good innovation We're going to take the person's word We're going to take the prophet's word and We're going to follow the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam All innovation is pro- in the religion is prohibited Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran Allahu adina lakum Am ala Allahi taftarun did Allah give you permission for that? Or are you inventing a lie upon Allah? You have permission to believe that? You have permission to say that in the religion? You have a permission to do that? You have a permission to pray like that? You have a permission to make hajj like that? 
You understand? So you, you, you we ha- in the religion, we have to do what Allah has legislated. It's not allowed for us to just make up our own religion within Allah's religion. This is what happened to the previous nations. This is why they don't have the truth with them anymore. Because they kept adding stuff, taking away stuff, putting this, what they want to put, take this out. Alhamdulillah, the Quran is complete and perfect and preserved. As Allah mentions in Nahnu Nazan Dika wa inna lahu lahafidun. Indeed, we revealed the revelation and we will preserve it. The revelation is preserved. That means the Quran and the Sunnah is preserved. So this is what is innovation. That's clear. Barakallah fiqh. So Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions ulaika hum rashidun those are the ones who are guided meaning those who love iman and are beautified with iman and they practice you know the deen and they hate disbelief and they hate corruption and they hate disobedience to Allah these people are guided So we understand from this that if if our hearts are inclined towards sin that this is misguidance like if we find delight in people disobeying Allah, know that there's something wrong with our iman. Right? And depending, if you love kufr, like major kufr, that puts you outside the, the, the deen. But like sins, and that doesn't put you outside the deen. Liking those things and... Like, you know, when I'm not saying, like, you know it's haram, but, you know, you find some type of pleasure in it. I'm not saying you believe it's halal, because if to believe uh, that something Allah made haram is halal, that's apostasy. Because you're rejecting now what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated. But sometimes you find, the Muslim may find himself, he knows something is haram, he believes it's haram, but still, he has like an inclination towards. Still, he finds like some type of delight and pleasure in it. That's because there's a deficiency in the person's faith. If we find ourselves in that situation, we have to strive to rectify and, and remove that from our hearts. We should never find delight and pleasure and the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love what Allah loves and we dislike what Allah dislikes. Right? As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, awfaq ural iman al hub fila wal bug fila. The strongest bond of faith is loving for the sake of Allah and disliking for the sake of Allah. So our love and our dislike should be based upon what Allah loves and what Allah dislikes. And this is guidance. A virtue from Allah and a blessing in Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. To be guided is a virtue and a blessing from Allah upon us. To have iman in our hearts and iman in our speech, iman, and our actions, this is guidance from Allah, and this is a virtue from Allah, and a blessing from Allah. So here you are, my noble sisters in Islam. You have guidance. You have iman in your heart. Alhamdulillah, you speak good words. Alhamdulillah, your actions are good, from wearing hijab and making the salat and Doing the things that Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded you to do, guarding your private parts from zina and the things like this. Alhamdulillah, this is guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you. This is a blessing from Allah and a virtue from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. Be grateful. Don't throw away the blessings of Allah and the ni'mah of Allah. And Allah is all knowing and all wise. Allah knows who he has chosen to be believers. And Allah chose those whom he has chosen based upon his knowledge and his wisdom. Whoever Allah has placed iman in their hearts, Allah put it in the right place for them. 
that he chose the right person. Allah doesn't make any mistakes. Allah doesn't make any mistakes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has chosen us to be Muslim. And then you have some individuals, Allah favors them, right, with His bounty and favor, and then they reject it. They throw it away. Like the, the Christian man in the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who accepted Islam, Allah guides him. After being a Muslim, he was chosen to be from amongst the people who write the revelation. Look at the favor of Allah upon this individual. What does he do? Rejects the favor of Allah, throws it away, and goes back to Christianity. And then he starts bad-mouthing the Prophet ﷺ. Saying that the Prophet ﷺ doesn't know anything except what he wrote for the Prophet subhanAllah like the, the epitome of being ungrateful. So when he died, Allah punished him. Made the earth spit his body out. So his, his Christian brethren, they buried him. And then when they came the next morning, they found his body spat out on the earth. So they said, oh, this was done by Muhammad and his companions. That's all Allah said. The Prophet... It's not from his character. He wouldn't do that. They blamed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, basically saying he's getting revenge because the man was speaking bad about him. It's not the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet never sought revenge for himself. But if the laws of Allah were violated, that's something different. The Prophet would get retribution and establish justice but for himself, the Prophet didn't get revenge for himself. But if it's a matter of the deen, the Prophet took action. So what did they do? They went and dug the grave deeper. It came in the morning, the body was spit out on the earth, on the ground, on the surface of the earth again. They said, they blamed the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba for doing this. They said, we're going to dig the grave deeper this time, very deep this time. And we're like, well, they can't do, they can't dig his body up. And, and they dug the grave as deep as they could and put him in the grave. And in the morning, same thing, found his body. And they realized that this was not from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba. This was a punishment from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It's a punishment. He rejected the favor of Allah. The earth rejected his body. Al Jazam and Jinsan Aman. The reward a person receives is based upon the type of action he do. The Shaykh says, In the Hudin, Aladi Aslahallahu bihi al Aqaid wal Akhlaq. وأصلح به الحياة الدنيا والآخرة. Indeed, Islam is a deen, is a religion, a way of life, which by which by way of Allah rectified the creed, the belief, and rectified the character, and He rectified by way of this deen, the life of this world and the hereafter. This deen is the deen of rectification. This deen is a deen of rectification. Shaykh Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came to rectify four things. He came to rectify the people's belief. He came to fix that. Because prior to the Prophet ﷺ, the people's belief was incorrect. So the Prophet came to fix the belief of the people. He came to fix the worship of the people because the people were worshiping the wrong way. Number three, he came to fix the character of the people. 
because the people character was not good. And number four, he came to fix the transactions that the people have with one another. So the four things. When the sisters hear this, they learn this and they understand this. This should solidify within their hearts that they are upon the right way. Because Islam rectifies all aspects of life. My noble sisters in Islam, you are following a way of life that brings about rectification. It fixes things. Islam fixes things. Islam is a solution to problems. This is your, your deen. You don't leave the solution for the problem. Kufr is a problem. Bid'ah is a problem. Disobedience to Allah, that's the problem. Shirk, that's the, those are problems. Don't leave the solution for the problem. Rather, leave the problems for the solution. Islam is the solution. Islam is the remedy. Islam is the cure. Islam is the rectification. Don't let nobody trick you out of your, your deen. Don't let nobody swindle you out of your deen. Don't let your desires be the cause of you leaving your deen. How did the Prophet fix the belief of the people? When the Prophet وسلم, was sent as a prophet and messenger, the majority of the people in Mecca, they had gods. There was over 300 idols around the Kaaba. And the people, they worshipped these gods. They believed in Allah. Don't think they didn't believe in Allah. They believed in Allah. But they made partners for Allah with these gods. What's the proof that they believed in Allah? When they were getting into difficult and tight situations where they thought that death would come to them they would call upon Allah alone they would call upon Allah alone like if they were on a boat at sea and the waves start to come and hit in the boat and they think the boat is going to capsize and they're going to fall into the sea and die Da'awullaha mukhlisina lahu deen, as Allah says. They call upon Allah sincerely, making the religion for Him. But when they go back to the lands and, and, and they're safe, they go back to worshiping their gods. As if they never called upon Allah in the first place. Look at the story when Abraha came with the elephants to destroy the Kaaba. The people of Mecca evacuated. Right? Mecca and went up. And Abdul Muttalib, he said, they said, what about the Kaaba? They said, he said, that house has a Lord who will protect it. <laughs> they believed in Allah. They believed in Allah. But why were they disbelievers? They were disbelievers because of them worshipping other than Allah along with Allah. This is shirk, to make partners with Allah. So the Prophet came to fix that. Because they believed that these gods that they had benefit them. And that they, these gods were entitled to worship. This is corruption in the Aqidah. So what was the Prophet's call? Ya qawmi qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. All oh, my people say la ilaha illallah and you will be successful. Look how the Prophet is fixing the people's belief. Teaching the people to believe correctly that only Allah has the right to be worshipped. So 
So what did they say in response? Allah says that the polytheists responded. This was their response to the Prophet Wasallam calling them to La ilaha illallah. Does he make all of the gods to just be one god that is worshipped? Indeed, this is a strange thing. So they understood when the Prophet Wasallam said to them, La ilaha illallah, they understood that he's calling them to the abandonment of the gods and making all worship for Allah alone and believing that this is the right of Allah and that Allah alone is to be worshipped. They didn't want abandonment. So when the Prophet said to his uncle, Ya Ammi, Kul la ilaha illallah. Karima uhaju biha anka in the Allah yawm al-qiyamah. Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah, a word that I can defend you with in front of Allah on the day of, on the day of judgment. Then it was said to Abu Talib, Atarghab an millati Abdul Muttalib. You're going to turn away from the religion of Abdul Muttalib? The Prophet kept repeating, Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah, a statement I can defend you with in front of Allah on the day of judgment. You're going to turn away from the religion of Abdul Muttalib? Oh my uncle, say la so. He, got, he has the Prophet وسلم, calling him to la ilaha illallah, to correct his belief, correct his, his, his religion. And then you have him being called to remaining upon the way of Abdul Muttalib. What did he die on? He died upon the middle of Abdul Muttalib. So he rejected Islam. He rejected the rectification. But he understood what the Prophet was calling him to. He understood. So the Prophet came to rectify the belief of the people. So the Prophet, he taught his Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, the correct aqidah. Wa alaykum salam He taught them the correct aqidah. You look, you look throughout the Qur'an, for the Qur'an is the best book in Aqidah. As Sheikh bin Baz ta'ala, was asked, what is the best book of Aqidah? He said the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the best book in Aqidah. And the Prophet taught the Qur'an to the people. The Prophet explained the Qur'an. And then you find also in the authentic hadith, the Prophet is teaching the Sahaba the correct Aqidah. From the beginning, to the end. Never was there a time the Prophet wasallam turned away from teaching Aqidah. He always taught Aqidah. He always taught the people how to believe correctly. And if somebody had an incorrect belief, the Prophet would correct them. If the person had a correct belief, the Prophet would approve. Like in the narration, of Muawiyah ibn Hakim al sulami He had a serving girl, he slapped her on her face because she was supposed to be watching his sheep and a wolf came and took away one of the sheep. He got mad, he slapped her. But after he slapped her, he regretted what he did. He knew that was wrong. He wasn't supposed to slap her. Especially in her face, this is wrong. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, O Messenger of Allah, I have a servant girl, she was watching over my flock, a wolf came, took away one of the sheep, I, I got angry like the son of Adam becomes angry, but I want to fix the situation, I want to make an atonement. The Prophet said, bring her to me. He brought her. He said, ain't Allah, call it fis sama. Call it man ana. Qalat anta Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Qala atika fa innaha mu'mina The Prophet asked her where is Allah She said Allah is above the heavens He said who am I She said you are the messenger of Allah The Prophet said let her go she's a believer True If she was wrong in her belief You know the Prophet would have corrected her right there No Allah is not 
above the heavens, Allah fi kulli makan. Allah is everywhere. But the Prophet didn't say that. Allah is not in every place. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Shalom Allah. ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله وحده محمد عبده ورسوله رضي بالله وسلم عليه اللهم ولا حول إلا بالله تم صلاة القائم فاتح محمد أمين مسلم رحمة الله أكبر Now, so if the girl was wrong in her statement that Allah is above the heavens, the Prophet would have corrected her. Right there on the spot. There was an individual, some years ago I had gave a lecture uh, in Jamaica, Queens. And then it was speaking about having the correct arcade and stuff. So there was an individual there who, he didn't like what I said about Allah being above the heavens. But this is not my statement. This is what Allah says. Ar Rahman, Ar Ashistawa. You mean the Muslim? He was a Muslim. He said, no, Allah is in every place. He, 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 his belief is that Allah is everywhere. But Allah says, Ar Rahman, Ar Al Ashistawa. And then I mentioned the narration of Muawiyah ibn Hakim al Sulami. And then I remember one of the brothers came to me after the, the lecture and he said, You know, Barak, thank you, brother. May Allah bless you. He said, You know, you're right. He said, If Allah was everywhere, then why the Prophet had to go on uh, Mi'raj? He said, He could he went like this. He could have just walked to, walked to Allah if Allah is everywhere. He didn't have to go anywhere. He said, Allah, yes, Allah is above because the Prophet had to go up to get the commandment for the Salat. But that individual who was there, he didn't say anything right there. What he did, he went and wrote a book trying to refute the issue of Allah being above. His response to the narration of the servant girl, he said, The Prophet didn't correct her because she was a new Muslim. <laughs> Allah Akbar. But the narration is clearly Come on, he said she's a believer. He established that her he, he established that she is a believer based upon her answer. Right. So she, if she she gave a wrong answer, she's a believer with a wrong answer. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, there are others. There's another. There's, there are other uh, incidents where new Muslims were corrected for mistakes in Aqidah, like when. The people of Mecca accepted Islam and they were going towards the, the battle of Hunayn and they said, Oh Messenger of Allah, make for us data and what? Like the polytheists have data and what? What's data and what? Data and what is a tree that the polytheists used to hang their weapons on to get barakah from the tree. So that when they go into battle, they're going to win the war. The Prophet said, Allahu Akbar. You said the same thing like the people of Musa said to Musa, Make for us gods or make for us a god like they have gods. The Prophet corrected them. The Prophet, they were new Muslims, the Prophet corrected them. What's the difference between them and her? He didn't correct the girl, but he corrected the other ones? 
And then on top of that, he, tell, he tells Muawiyah to let her go. She's a believer based upon a wrong answer? Come on. Falsehood. Her answer was correct. Just like her answer that he's the messenger of Allah, so the life then was correct. So that's why he said, let her go. She is a believer. Look how he established her iman based upon what she believed and given the correct answers. The Prophet came to correct the belief system of the people. And if a person believes correctly, the Prophet confirms the belief. This is a part of the correction. Part of the rectification. Confirming what is correct. Likewise, the Prophet came to fix the ibadah of the people. The people of Quraysh, the people used to make hajj prior to the Prophet's time, or the Prophet becoming a Prophet But there were some practices that they had were incorrect. From those practices, a woman would go around the Kaaba naked with no clothes on. Or a person would carry her they pick her up, lift her up, and then her privates is like there. You know, I don't want to be graphic. Right. So this is this was their worship. Around the Kaaba. A woman going they're carrying a naked woman on them, and she's they're going around the Kaaba with her. So the Prophet وسلم, at a point he came and made the decree. After this year, no polytheist is to come and make hajj, and no woman is to go around the Kaaba naked anymore. He, st- he abolished that practice. See how he came to fix the ibadah? Also, the Prophet Wasallam said, Sallu kama ra'aytu muni usali. Pray the way you see me pray. So there was a companion, he came to the masjid, and he, he made salat and then he came to the Prophet and said, Assalamu alaikum. The Prophet said, Wa alaikum assalam. The Prophet said, Irja for salli for inna kalam to salli. Go back and pray you didn't make salat. The sahabi went back and made it, pray again. Came to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave salam. The Prophet said, Wa alaikum assalam. Irja for salli for inna kalam to Go back and pray you haven't prayed. He went and prayed the third time he came. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they gave salams. He returned the salam. Go back and pray you haven't prayed. He said, by Allah, O Messenger of Allah, I can't do no better than this. Then the Prophet began to teach him to correct his salat. When you stand, say Allah. When you do this, make sure your back is straight. When you go into bow, make sure all the, he began to correct them and show him where his mistake. This is the Prophet He fixes the ibadah. He teaches us how to worship properly. Then you look at akhlaq, the character. Uh, Abu Dhar radiallahu an, he has said to, I think it was Bilal, you're the son of a black woman. The Prophet said, you criticize a man because of his mother, or you're the son of a slave. He said, you're a person, you have some jahiliyyah in you. The Prophet reprimanded him, because that's bad character. It's your brother in Islam. You don't criticize your brother in Islam because he comes from a different, a different ethnic background. There's to be no racism in Islam or looking down upon a person because of their race, their color, their, eth- their ethnicity. No, you don't do that. Allah Azza mentions, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى Indeed, the believers are nothing but brothers to one another. Allah Azza wa mentions, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقُنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شِعُوبًا وَقَبَائِنَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّا أَقْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Alaykum as-salam O mankind Indeed, we created you from a male and a female And we made you into different like uh, nations and tribes so that you know one another Indeed, the most honorable of you with Allah are those, is the one who has the most taqwa, or those who have the most taqwa. It's not about the color of your skin. But Abu Dhar made a mistake in making that statement. So the Prophet reprimanded him. Look how the Prophet came to correct the people's character. One time, as far as transactions, the Prophet is walking in the marketplace. And as he's walking in the marketplace, he passes, like, I guess, by like a store. And the person has like, he's selling rice and food stuff. The prophet put his hand inside of it. It was wet on the bottom. 
but dry on the top. So the Prophet wasallam asked him, what's this? So the man said, it rained last night and it got on it, so I put the wet part on the bottom and the dry part on top. He said, why didn't you put the wet part on top so that the people could see what, they, what it is? And then look what the Prophet said, wasallam. Man ghashana falaysa minna. Whoever deceives us is not from us. That's the that's the mu'amala, that's transactions. So we have many examples in, in relation to islah al-aqeedah, islah al-ibadah, islah al-akhlaq, islah al-mu'amala min al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet rectifying the aqeedah, the Prophet rectifying the worship, the Prophet rectifying the character, the Prophet rectifying the transactions. We have many examples. So when a sister knows this, the Muslim woman, she knows this, she knows that she's on the correct way of life. And that the Prophet Muhammad is her, her leader, her role model, the one who she follows because he came to rectify and fix things, not to corrupt things. So she's following a Prophet who was a reformer, the true reformer. The Prophet he fixes things and he reforms the society from bad to good. So this is what the sisters to understand that Allah has favored her with following the best of mankind the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inshallah ta'ala will stop at this point as it is time for salat al-isha whatever is correct the praise is for Allah whatever is incorrect is for myself wa subhanaka wa alhamdulillah